Okay, welcome everyone to this evening's China Chat. I am Jim Mockford, president of the Northwest China Council in this year of the tiger. We had snow this morning here in Portland. So I hope you're safe and snug in your homes this evening. And you might know that our Siberian tigers at the Oregon Zoo are quite happy with today's weather. But elsewhere around the world, people are quite concerned uh, as war has come to the Ukraine. And of course, we are concerned with uh, people that we may know, in fact, in person, uh, friends in that part of the world. For over 40 years, the Northwest China Council has served the community as a nonprofit organization founded in 1980 in Portland, Oregon, uh, to promote a better understanding of China, US-China relations, Chinese language and culture. And we are a non-political organization. So the wide range of views by our speakers and our members in Q&A are not those of the organization. Uh, helping to produce the event this evening is our executive director, John Wong. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, and as John continues to admit people from the waiting room, it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Frederick Green. Uh, Dr. Green is Associate Professor of Chinese at San Francisco State University and Associate Director of the Chinese Flagship Program uh, there, which is a federally funded intensive track to training program in Chinese language and culture. He asked me not to say too much in the introduction, but I will say from his hometown in Rendsburg, Germany, he made his way to St. John's College uh, at Cambridge University and received his BA in China Studies, and then went on to Yale University for his PhD in Chinese Literature. During his talk, he will mention the many other places around the world that his scholarly adventures have taken him and tell us, tell us how <laughs> he discovered the literature of the Republican period in China and the author Xu Xu, who created the stories that Dr. Green has translated into English for the non-Chinese reading world to, to read as we are able to do in this book, Bird Talk by Xu Xu, and other stories by Xu Xu, Modern Tales of, by a Chinese Romantic, of a Chinese Romantic. So I enjoyed this great book. And at the end of the talk, we're gonna let our, uh, our program be moderated by our board member, our own uh, Dr. Jeff Kinkley, who is a retired professor of history at St. John's University and also specialized in intellectual and literary history of 20th century China. And he's a translator as well of the Chinese author Shen Pangwen into English. So there's no one better than, the doc, than our own board member, Dr. Jeff Kinkley, to provide some commentary at the end and moderate questions that come in from the audience. Since this program is in webinar format, you should enter any questions you have at any time during the Q&A uh, function button that's at the bottom of your screen. And uh, at the end, Dr. Kinkley will take a look at your questions. Hopefully they're not in the chat line. We might have time to look at comments in the chat line, but um, we think that we need to proceed with the Q&A uh, part first. So hopefully you can find that button and ask questions at any time that will come at the end. I think that concludes my introductory remarks. Again, thank you for joining us. And welcome to Northwest China Council, Dr. Frederick Green. Well, thank you so much for that very warm introduction. Thank you, John, Jim, Jeff, Dr. Kingsley. Um, you know, it's such an honor to be here. Um, well, sort of virtually to be here uh, with the uh, Northwest China Council and, um, you know, Dr. Kingley, of course, you know, you've been a great inspiration. Um, you know, your your own translation work. Um, so I'm I'm really thrilled that you are going to be moderating the Q&A. Thank you for that in advance. So um, what I would like to do today is to retrace for you the physical and the literary journey of this really, really fascinating writer Xu Xu through 20th century China um, and also to read a few passages from my translations. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share some slides while I talk and then when I read um, I'm, I'm going to um, stop sharing and I'll read to you 
Um, and I'll also, if we have time, show a few little clips, a few fun clips. So let me um, go to share mode and share my slides. Go to slideshow. Okay. And <clears throat> I want to start by just saying a few words about Xu Xu. Here's a photo of him uh, from the 1940s. So Xu Xu was born in 1908 and he passed away in 1980. So his literary career really coincided with some of the big social upheavals that China experienced during the 20th century. And his fiction is really tied up with those events in very interesting ways. Um, the two characters in his name, uh, if, if you can read Chinese, can also be read as Xu. And that is actually a, uh, a reading that he himself preferred, but because his name was Romanized as Xu Xu when it was first entered into the Library of Congress, in, I, I think in the 1940s or 1950s, um, as Xu Xu, most people, even in China now, call him Xu Xu. So we kind of stuck with that. Uh, like many writers of the early Republican period, uh, the Republican period right, being the time right after the, you know, the fall of the Qing up until 1949, um, you know, so, so like many people who uh, are writers who grew up in that period, that transitional period, his early education was very much steeped both in classical learning and in modern education that became more and more prevalent in 20th century China. He then went on to study philosophy and psychology at Peking University uh, between 1927 and 1932, but then he moved to Shanghai in 1932, which was of course the publishing hub of Republican period China. And in Shanghai, Xu Xu came under the auspices of Lin Yutang, the well-known polyglot writer and critic who ran a number of very successful publishing ventures in Shanghai at the time. And Xu Xu first worked as an editor for a couple of those journals, namely Lun Yu, The Analects, and Ren Jian Shi. And they were incredibly popular journals, a little bit like The New Yorker, you know, literary journals, um, humor, cartoons, but also sort of current affairs. Um, and they didn't have a particular, particular political alignment that kind of made them very um, attractive, I think, to readers at the time. At that time, Xu Xu mostly wrote poetry, but he also composed essays, Xiao Pin Wen. That was something that Lin Yutang was very much into and very much promoting. But he also started to write his first works of fiction. And in his fiction, he tended to display a distinct cosmopolitan liberalism and exoticism that became the hallmark of his early fiction, along with a deliberate blurring of dreams and reality. He liked that a lot. I actually have a quote here uh, on the slide from an early novella called The Goddess of the Arabian Sea, where a, a narrator travels to Europe and on board of this ship, he, he, he meets this, this goddess. And the narrator in, the, in you know, this piece of fiction, he proclaims that, um, I want to pursue all artistic fantasies because their beauty to me is reality. In this world, there are people who pursue dreams of the real while I'll seek out the real within dreams. And this is interesting because it was really quite the opposite of what most progressive, mostly leftist political writers at the time advocated, right? They tended to produce works of social realism and not exotic fantasies. Um, in 1936, Xu Xu then leaves Shanghai to study abroad in Paris. And while in Paris, his novella Ghost Love, Gui Lian, appeared in the Shanghai journal Celestial Winds, Yu Zhou Feng, that was another one of Lin Yutang's journals. And it became quite a literary sensation um, and to this day, it's probably one of his best known works. He later published the story as a book. He rewrote it slightly. And, you know, in 10 years following the initial publication, it went through 19 print runs. It was turned into a movie in 1939. So it really struck a chord with the reading public. I'm going to read you the opening of Ghost Love, which is set around the year 1930. And it opens with a confident cosmopolitan first person male narrator who often populates Xu Xu's novels. We always have these, these, these um, 
confident, very cosmopolitan male narrators. And they sort of often kind of resemble a little bit Xu Xu himself. It's almost autobiographical, <laughs> that character. Um, and this character meets this mysterious uh, woman one night on Shanghai's Nanjing Road, the main thoroughfare. Now, while there are references to traditional Chinese ghost stories, the story is really intrinsically modern and really a testimony to Shanghai's urban modernity. So let me stop sharing and I'm going to read out um, the opening. What I am about, uh, what I'm about to relate happened six or seven years ago on a wintry evening around midnight. I was walking out of Xiangfen Alley and onto Nanjing Road. The moment I turned the corner, right there by the tobacco store, I saw a woman entirely dressed in black. There was an incomparable pureness to her beauty and, strange as it might sound, I had the impression that somehow she looked familiar. Yet I could not recall then where it was that I had seen her before. Was it because I was drawn to her beauty or because I wanted to figure out where I had seen her before? In any case, I could not help but throw another glance at her. I also no longer remember now whether that tobacco shop handed out matches or had an incense coil for the customers to light their cigarettes. But just as she turned around, she let out a puff of smoke from the cigarette she was smoking and I got a whiff of its aroma. The moment I smelled her cigarette, I knew she was smoking a pinhead. Pinheads were um, a British uh, cigarette brand that was very popular in Shanghai at the time. Surely pinheads were a little strong for that lady, and I immediately assumed that she must be a heavy smoker with blackened teeth. What a pity to have such exquisite beauty spoiled by a row of blackened teeth, I thought. I was already on my way again when she suddenly interrupted my thoughts. Human, tell me the direction to Shia Tu Road. I jumped with bewilderment. As she spoke, I was able to see her teeth, or I should say, her teeth grabbed my attention. They shone bright white, like a precious sword under the moon. But once she had closed her mouth again, I also noticed a particularly fierce look in her eyes. Her face, which at first had been lit up by the shop's red neon lights, was in fact silvery white drained of all color. Her lips looked especially sallow and bloodless. Had she put on too much powder? Was she recovering from an illness? Still contemplating, I almost asked, why didn't you put on some rouge? But it was she who spoke again. Sheer to road, I said, sheer to road. It suddenly occurred to me that the reason she looked so pale might be because her clothes were all black. She was wearing a black chi pao, black coat, black stockings, and black shoes. I also noticed that her clothes seemed much too thin. They were all single layer, and the coat did not have a fur lining. Besides, her stockings were made of silk, and she was wearing high heels. Could it be that her face was white from cold? I wanted to look at her fingernails, but she was wearing a pair of fine white gloves on her hands, one of which was holding the cigarette she was smoking. Human, why are you looking at me like that? Her face was solemn, but overwhelmingly beautiful. It now made me think of the face of a silver female bust I had seen in a shop window somewhere along Avenue Joffre in the French concession of Shanghai. So that was why I had thought that I had seen her before. The beauty of her face lay in its harmonious structure that lacked any crudeness. I felt a little comical about my déjà vu experience, but nevertheless put on a serious face and said, even when asking for directions, you should be a little polite. Fine if you don't want to call me sir or master, but how about a simple mister? What's this business calling me human? You're neither a goddess nor the almighty. Actually, I was thinking that her beauty had something rather divine, and so my last sentence had been spoken somewhat inadvertently. I'm not a goddess, she replied. I'm a ghost. So, uh... Let's leave it at that. Um, and I'll go back to my slides. Um, so, in 90, um, sorry, um, here we go. So the two, sorry, the two then start a liaison. And, you know, we as readers accompany them on their nightly strolls 
through Shanghai. And we can actually follow on the heels, which is why I included this map um, on the slides, but also in the book. Um, you know, the geography of Shanghai played a really important role in Chinese urban modernist fiction from the 1920s and 1930s, quite similar to the way Berlin or Tokyo or New York, you know, featured prominently in Western fiction. And um, so you can see, you know, we, it starts out at the tobacco store and then they walk through the international settlement and down Avenue Joffre and Xu um, Jiahui. So it's, um, it's, you know, we, we really can follow them along and, and especially readers who'd be familiar with the geography of Shanghai would take, you know, great pleasure in that. So the story does touch also on the political struggles in Shanghai and China of the 19th 20s, but ultimately remains largely skeptical of collective action and, and ideological narratives and essentially is individualistic in nature. And thus, again, quite different from more progressive or, or leftist fiction of the period. And I will return to that in a little while. Um, now, in 1938, Xu Xu leaves Paris and he hastily returns to Shanghai after the outbreak of war with Japan. And he remains in Shanghai for the time being, but he eventually then leaves for Chongqing um, uh, after, you know, the fall of, uh, after Pearl Harbor and the fall of Shanghai in 1941. And in Chongqing, he wrote his wartime spy novel, The Rustling Wind, Feng Xiao Xiao, which is probably his most famous work, set in Shanghai in the years leading up to Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor and related again through the eyes of this cosmopolitan first-person narrator, The Rustling Wind is an epic tale of love and espionage that again captured the reading audience, um, you know, at the time through its vivid depiction of life in Shanghai's foreign concession, but also the promise of agency, you know, in this global conflict that China found itself part of. Now, The Rustling Wind, unfortunately, is way too long and um, I didn't translate it. Um, but I, I did translate a short story um, called The Jewish Comet, Yo Tai De Hui Xiang, from the same period. And it sort of explores some you know, similar themes that we also find in Feng Xiao Xiao, the, the rustling wind. So in The Jewish Comet, a Chinese male narrator, also called Xu, so again, we have that sort of quasi autobiographical narrator here, um, travels to Europe aboard an Italian steamer. And again, this is sort of 1937, 1938. He travels to Europe um, aboard this Italian steamer and he falls in love with a, what later turns out to be a Jewish secret agent who's fighting fascism in Europe. Um, and I was again going to read out um, just the opening. It's, it's kind of, it's, um, it's kind of fun. Um, let's see, here it is. <laughs> When I awoke, all I could see through the pothole was the open sea. I immediately thought of her. Had she gotten sick? Had this big plan been abandoned after all? Yet when I got out of my bunk to have a cigarette, I saw two unfamiliar pieces of luggage. When I also noticed some items of makeup and some toiletries next to the wash basin, I knew that she must have come on board after all. Still, I was not entirely sure yet because when I had gone to bed, it was three in the morning. The ship had been scheduled to sail at four. Could she really have embarked that late? I wanted to find out and slipped into my shoes. The lower bunk was empty, but the blanket was tousled. She must have already gotten up. Yes, indeed, she must have already gotten up because her toiletries were wet. In addition, I spotted two brown strands of hair in the wash basin. I could not remember whether her hair had been brown or black or blonde, but these strands surely must have been hers. It was already ten. I hurriedly washed and went to the dining room to have breakfast. She probably had already finished hers and stepped out on deck, I thought. There were still a few scattered passengers in the dining room. Even before I could step inside and see if maybe she was still there, I noticed a woman dressed in blue and gray waving at me from a table on the left. I had no idea whether it was her or not, but since it was a European-looking woman who was waving at me, it had to be her. When I walked over to her, she took hold of my hand, giving the semblance of intimacy and familiarity. 
I sat down across from her. She asked me if I had slept well the previous night and what time I had boarded the ship, as well as a whole lot of other questions. I'm usually not much of a conversationalist, and all I could say as she was quizzing me over breakfast uh, was to reply to her questions, even if I had wanted to ask something in return. Only when she had finished breakfast and taken out her cigarette did I finally have a chance. I took out a match and, lighting her cigarette for her, asked, it must have been close to four when you came on board. Yes, she said hastily, exhaling her first drag of smoke. I thought it might, I might, uh, it might bother you if I came on board any earlier. When someone from China sails to Europe, it's just like when we Europeans travel to China. It's such a long journey, and there surely were a lot of relatives and friends who came to see you off. Wouldn't have raised eyebrows if they had seen you depart with a foreign woman? Miss, but I thought, now don't call me that. We're already husband and wife. Husband and wife should not address each other in that way, according to neither Chinese nor Western customs. Isn't that right? You had best address me by my first name. I'm called Catherine. I blushed a little. I, a 30 plus year old divorced father of a daughter and son, made to blush by a 20 something year old woman. I began to have regrets, regretted that I had agreed to her becoming my wife. How had all this come about? It had begun three months earlier. After the Ministry of Education announced that it would send me to Europe to study vocational education, I made my way to Shanghai to prepare for my stay abroad. I had never had the habit of wearing Western style clothes. And so I had to purchase an entire wardrobe from necktie to dress shirt. I found a shop on Avenue Joffre in the French concession of Shanghai that was comparatively inexpensive. The store was tiny and its owner was accountant, sales clerk and assistant all at one. My several purchases at the store had led me to become acquainted with the owner, who was named Shackles. He told me that he was Norwegian and that he was Jewish. He was short and plump, had a moustache and was in his forties. He told me that he had gotten around quite a bit and that he spoke several languages. My first destination was going to be France, and because my French was pretty rusty, I took the opportunity to practice with him whenever he was not too busy uh, with his store. He usually wasn't. Business was slow, probably because it was the middle of the summer. I would buy a few things and then chat with him for an hour or two. Let's leave it at that. So it's through this friendship with this Jewish shop owner that um that you know the narrator eventually gets acquainted with Catherine, that woman on the ship who then draws him into this cobweb of espionage that takes him to europe aboard that steamer right that he just woke up on um so let me go back to the uh share mode um now um so the jewish comet um so it's driven by, you know, it's driven by a mix of mystery and exoticism that is really quite typical of his, his pre-war stories. But the Jewish comet also speaks to the interest cosmopolitan readers in Shanghai took in European politics and the plight of the Jews in particular. And, you know, the Jewish comet is actually one of the very few works of Chinese fiction that explores the presence of Jews in pre-war and wartime Shanghai. And the ship the narrator takes in the story, the Contevada, you have an image here on the slide, um, which is actually the ship that Xu Xu took when he traveled to Europe in 1936, was actually, you know, actually played a major role in helping thousands of Jews escape Europe and seek refuge uh, in Shanghai just before the outbreak of war. So it's kind of, you know, there's really a historical angle to the story that's, that's quite fascinating. Now, in the meantime, leftist critics had taken issues with Xu Xu's literary aesthetics, especially of, uh, you know, sort of blurring dream and reality and all that, all throughout the 1930s and 1940s. In 1939, the Marxist critic Baren had called Xu Xu's fiction a bomb full of poison, capable of extinguishing the fighting spirit of thousands of revolutionaries. And in 1945, the young Marxist critic uh, Shi Huai Chi uh, wrote of Xu Xu's novella Ghost Love, of which you 
heard the opening, it will invariably cause you to forget the cruel reality of the world, cause you to ignore the hideous scars our nation has received and lead you to distance yourself from that cruel struggle between old and new that is currently being carried out all around us. It is a syringe filled with poison and you should throw it into the cesspool. Um, I, I want to um, show you a very short clip that is quite um quite amazing you see if um let me sorry actually um let me go back to the uh share just for one second um the other slide um so i want to show you a, a, a clip um you know even fiction even communist fiction at the time um sort of epitomized ghost love as, you know, really these symbol of depravity and counter-revolutionary tendencies. And I'm going to show you a very short clip now from a movie adaptation of a novel by the novelist uh, Wang Meng. And, you know, his, his, this, he wrote this novel, Qing Chun Wan Sui, The Song of Youth in 1954. And, you know, it was turned into a movie in uh, 1983. So, and I'm, you know, that's the clip um, I, I want to show you. Uh, it's in Chinese, uh, but I don't think you, even if you don't understand Chinese, you'll get a sense of what it's about, and then I'll translate afterwards. Um, so, let me do this. You <laughs> Yo! <laughs> 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 我头疼，看别的书，我觉得累得慌。看这种书，你不觉得气得慌？张妹。Okay, um, so so basically, you know, this 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 novel and the movie is about this, you know, young generation is this full of idealism, right? Right after the founding of the People's Republic of China, and you know, this girl is visiting her friend, and this girl uh, you probably could see from the photos and the images she had on the wall clearly is not isn't doesn't have the right revolutionary mindset but what's even wor worse is that she's reading ghost love right and her friend then asks her you reading this book and she says well you know i <laughs> my head hurts if i read anything else i get really tired and you know and, and then she sort of says you know doesn't it make you feel really angry if you read this book so um you know it's it's quite comical almost when we see this uh today let me you know share back the the um the slides um so you know it, it's quite comical but it's it's really criticism like this you know the, the the literary critics and you know writers uh that that led xu xu to leave the newly founded people's republic of china and you know of course many writers who were labeled bourgeois or, or you know counter-revolutionaries ended up getting into very serious political trouble in the 1950s you know ended up in prison many of them committed suicide so he you know he saw saw that coming with that literary baggage that he had right all those those wonderful exotic stories that he had written so in 1950 Xu Xu decides to leave China for Hong Kong on what he thought and hoped would be a temporary exile at most, but what actually would prove to be a lifelong exile. And, um, you know, bird talk, here you have a cover of the original Chinese, and that's the title story of my translations. Bird talk was published in 1951, and it's one of the first stories that he wrote after coming to Hong Kong. And for me, it really epitomizes Xu Xu's literary aesthetics from Hong Kong. Um, the work of fiction, you know, the, the works of fiction he wrote after leaving China 
changed somewhat from his pre-war works. While in his early fiction, we have these very confident first-person narrators traveling to foreign countries, meeting mysterious women, falling in love with them. The first-person narrator in his Hong Kong works is now usually an exile, looking very much for lost happiness, longing for a lost love, a lost home, um, a time really to which there was no return. The Republican era had ended, the Cold War was a new reality, and for the most part, you know, the narrator in his Hong Kong works, while still being a first-person narrator, is now really a, a guest in transit, in exile, always searching. Um, so I want to read, um, I, I want to read a passage from uh, Bird Talk then. Um, and let me, um, let me unshare again. Um, so, you know, the novella opens in Hong Kong where the narrator receives a package through the mail that contains a copy of the Diamond Sutra and news and a letter that informs him of the passing of his fiance from many years ago. And this then trigger, triggers a flashback that takes him back to the pre-war Chinese countryside where the narrator, who's originally from Shanghai, is convalescing. And he meets this young woman who is slighted uh, by the other villagers because of her very unusual behavior. But, you know, this, this girl really piques his, uh, you know, his interest and he wants to find out what it's all about, you know, with this, with, with this girl. So I'm reading, I'm going to read a couple, uh, you know, a, a, a passage from early on, and then I'm going to read one from the very end. I became determined to find out what she was really up to. So I rose early one morning, even before the birds had begun to sing. The sky was not yet completely light, and I went into the garden to find a place that was close enough to the fence uh, where she usually stood, yet also hidden by the bamboo thicket. Then I waited for her. It was a hazy morning. The sky was colorless, except for a faint red glow in the east. Soon the birds in the bamboo thicket started to sing. At first there was only one, chirping away in a clear and captivating way and flying from branch to branch. Another one began to sing, as if answering the other. Just then I heard a response from beyond the fence and I caught sight of the girl wearing a grey dress, her hair done up in two braids. A chorus of birds began chirping away from inside the bamboo thicket. The two birds that had sung to each other flew to the fence and began trilling at the girl on the other side. The girl raised her head. Her face was round and her eyes shone brightly. She bore a happy smile. The sounds she was making were beautiful. They now neither sounded like the trilling of birds, nor did they sound like singing. The girl and the two birds seemed like old acquaintances. The birds flew back and forth between the fence and her shoulder and then landed on the fence and chirped affectionately. By then, the morning haze had already disappeared and the sun shone onto the dewy grass. I was able to see the girl's clear, her face clearer now. Her chin was pointed and she had thin lips, a delicate nose and a broad forehead. Her eyes were radiant. What was most astonishing was her skin. It seemed as if it had rarely been exposed to the sun. It was a very light complexion, like porcelain, not at all like that of other country folk. Suddenly a bird flew into the bamboo thicket. Had it noticed me? It called out from, in, from the inside and then came flying out again. I could see that the girl was looking straight at me now and I thought it best to come forward and greet her. I took a few quick steps forward um, toward the fence and, slightly bowing toward her, said, Good morning. Um, so what, what then happens is the narrator uh, takes her under her wings and he tries to teach her math and other subjects, but it proves just as futile as she trying to teach him bird talk. And that, you know, that's sort of her secret. She can communicate with birds. But then one day they start reading poetry together and she experiences the same subliminal pleasure as, as when listening to birds. So she has this intuitive understanding of poetry. And then the narrator slowly falls in love with her and he takes her uh, with, with him to Shanghai. But in Shanghai, she's deeply unhappy. So he decides to abandon his life in Shanghai 
and to move to the countryside with her. And on the way back to the village, they stay in a Buddhist convent where she displays again the same intuitive understanding of Buddhist sutras as she had displayed when reading poetry uh, or communicating with birds. And so he decides to leave her in this monastery, you know, this, this, this Buddhist convent. She did not belong with me. She belonged in a world unspoiled by worldly matters. Only in such a world could her sublimity and magnificence manifest itself. Only in such a world could she truly feel at ease and be happy. I would be of no help or value to her. I had become superfluous. In fact, I had become an emotional burden to her, just like she had been a burden to me in Shanghai. What was there left to say? I did not see Yunxian again. Early the next day, I descended the hill and immediately returned to Shanghai. My life in Shanghai returned to its usual grind. Petty quarrels, social engage engagements kept me busy, and I had my share of ups and downs. I was hoping that I would quickly forget Yunxian, yet she would invariably appear in my mind in moments of fatigue and loneliness, even though our worlds were so far apart. In the years that followed, I wandered aimlessly. I indulged in wine and women. I got worn down by poverty and sickness, living out of tiny rooms. I threw myself into frivolous affairs and participated in noisy brawls. I changed from one job to the next, I drifted from place to place. I married, got divorced, raised kids, went to America and Europe. I sold my songs and my stories and everything else to make ends meet. And in the end, I drifted to Hong Kong. I forgot Yunxian, I forgot her a long time ago. But every time I travel to the countryside and gaze at the mountains and streams and the lush forests, I hear the distant singing of birds. The figure of Yunxian faintly flashes into my memory. But it is just a fleecy cloud drifting by in the sky, and as soon as I return to my mundane existence, I forget her again. How many times had I thought of writing her a letter to ask how she was doing? But when I looked at my own vulgar life, I could never muster the courage to disturb her pure and peaceful soul. Yet when I received the Diamond Sutra through the mail, I realized at once that it was the one that we had studied together in our, on our third day in the convent, sitting at a table in the small courtyard. The letter and the sutra had been sent from my grandmother's village. I did not know which of my relatives still lived there or how they had gotten hold of my address. That was, of course, not too difficult, since many of my relatives and friends in Shanghai knew of my whereabouts. In any case, I had no de desire to know. I looked at myself in the mirror. What a vulgar face. I tossed away the mirror. As my tears fell on the open sutra, my eyes caught sight of a line in the opening chapter. All sentient beings, whether born from eggs or born from a womb, or born from moisture or born through metamorphosis, will eventually be led by me to enter nirvana where all their anguish will be extinguished um so let me go to the slides one more time and so um now in hong kong then um, Xu Xu really, through his fiction, laments both his personal loss, you know, he was separated from, from his family, um, and also the end of an era, you know, the Republican period, pre-war Shanghai, um, and this nostalgia he shared, of course, with countless other displaced Chinese in the post-war era. And this nostalgia, which was so elegantly expressed in Bird Talk, is often expressed through a return to the past, finding solace in sublimity of nature, or poetry, dreams, or even the surreal. Actually, there's another story in the collection called The All Souls Tree, Bai Ling Shu, which is, also has this very surreal twist to it. And, you know, it also connects Xu Xu and, and post-war Hong Kong literature, I think, to a global literary um, artistic modernity in that there are, of course, many other 20th century artists who had similar aesthetic, um, you know, and a similar aesthetic vision. And Xu Xu, I think, stood very much in dialogue with some of them. Uh, I want to show you 
one other slide, you see Xu Xu usually designed his own book covers. And for a collection of 1964, he chose an image by Marc Chagall, which completely makes sense, I think, because, you know, the nostalgia of an exile, the desire to create a world in your imagination, to escape into a dream world, is something I think they both share. And I think, um, you know, Xu Xu must have felt sort of an artistic sense of camaraderie with, with Chagall or, or kinship. And, you know, Xu Xu, I think, really taps into this global artistic modernity in that way. Now, um, Xu Xu um, continued to shape the Chinese literary field in Hong Kong as a writer, as a critic, as an educator. He taught at several colleges, eventually becoming the dean um, you know, of the humanities at Hong Kong Baptist University. He played an important role as an editor. He revived several journals from, you know, the pre-war period, among them the Analects Lun Yu, uh, you know, Lin Yu Tang's famous journal. He became the editor of that. He had his own journals. Um, you know, here is a cover from one called Qi Yi, The Seven Arts, which was sort of a uh, our literature and art, architecture, um, you know, even translations of Western or Japanese literature. Um, you know, post-war Hong Kong, of course, was in effect the only place in the Chinese-speaking world that enjoyed a relatively free press and very limited censorship. And Xu Xu, with his very cosmopolitan outlook and very broad interests, you know, really facilitated the influx of, of new ideas and gave a platform to an emerging generation of um, of Hong Kong writers. Um, you know, we're, we're sort of a little bit out of time. I'm, um, I'm going to speed this up a little bit. Um, you know, um, there's also a really interesting connection between Xu Xu and cinema in Hong Kong. You know, cinema, of course, over time would become the quintessential Hong Kong medium. And Xu Xu himself really played a, a pivotal role in that. You know, even before the war, I already mentioned that Gui Lian, Ghost Love, had been turned into a movie in Shanghai. But after the war, um, you know, the Shanghai movie industry, uh, um, you know, moved to Hong Kong and many of its most illustrious stars with it. Um, so here are just you know two examples of, 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 of his books that were adapted to the screen. Um, and, you know, I actually wanted to show you a clip. I, I think I won't do it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put this URL into the chat um, and you can watch it on your own. This is from a movie called Blind Love, uh, which is another very popular uh, work of fiction that he wrote in Hong Kong. Again, it's sort of, you know, has this nostalgia for, you know, Shanghai, the pre-war period. But what's really interesting is that Xu Xu actually has a cameo appearance in the movie. I have some screenshots here. So there he is, you know, in the first screenshot on the left. And, you know, he's a writer and he comes into this graveyard. He walks around this graveyard and he sees somebody there leaving a manuscript and he picks up the manuscript. And then he goes and sees, um, you know, his friends, his friends are having a party. And these friends are all these Shanghai movie stars. You know, the sort of the who is who of the sh old Shanghai, now Hong Kong movie industry. And they say, hey, you've, you've, you know, what do you have there? And he says, well, this is this manuscript I just found. And he starts to read it out and it becomes the movie. And all these people, are obviously, you know, starring in the movie. Um, so let me, um, you know, if you're curious about that, I'll just, I'll just pop that into the, oops. Um, I'll just pop that into the, um, into the chat. Oops, I'll do that now. And then you can, you know, you can, you can watch it. Oops. On your own. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, I do want to show you just a couple more slides before we can open it to questions. Okay, so, um, you know, I, I really, so here's a couple more pictures of him uh, with Lin Yutang, 1976, but I really want to, you know, I want to close with a quote from a review of Burtok, the translation that was published in the South China Morning Post. 
Um, you know, what's really interesting is that Xu Xu is sort of being rediscovered in Hong Kong now or over the past decade or so. He's really been rediscovered um, by readers and critics. And I think that has something to do with the changing political fortune of Hong Kong at this very moment. You know, Xu Xu, of course, had chosen Hong Kong precisely because it offered him a place where he could write and where he could express himself freely. Um, and I think this really has a sort of a new significance to a lot of people in Hong Kong. Um, and, you know, this reviewer wrote, Hong Kong is where many like Xu Xu, sick with longing and trauma and facing a harsh new world, could begin to heal themselves. Um, and I, 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 I want to leave it with that. Um, I'm going to stop sharing. Um, and I hope we'll have some questions in a little bit of time to, um, to discuss. So, Jeff, I'll pass it back to you and, and Jim. <laughs> All right. Am I on? Yeah. Okay. Well, I feel like a, something of an interloper here, uh, despite some interesting uh, shared aspects of our research interests and even our early career patterns. Uh, but I, I have to thank Jim Mockford for actually arranging this whole gig uh, because of his uh, relationship with uh, a descendant of Shu Shu's, who I believe is one of our participants now, and we would certainly welcome any comments from her. Thank, thank you, Jim, and also John Wong, my my new old friend uh, from uh, the Northwest China Council. Uh, we're running short on time. I will just say uh, one question that Frederick uh, asked me was whether or not. Uh, Shen Sun Wan and Xu Xu ever crossed paths. And I should add, actually, Fred and I have not crossed paths before. It, it's kind of amazing, uh, but I guess that's that's our human condition here uh, these last couple of years, anyway. Uh, as far as I know, not. But the complete works of Shen Sun Wan have been coming out. There are now thirty-seven volumes, including four volumes that just came out a little more than a year ago, and I have not gone through those. Uh, Xu Xu, I think, has, what, 15 or 16 volumes of his collected works. So we're going to have to learn how to speed read Chinese, I think, before we answer these. I was thinking, although Shen Song Wan edited many feuilletons, uh, like the Da Wung Ba Wan Yi Fu Kan, actually, Xu, it's quite possible that uh, Xu Xu published an article or two by Shen Song Wan in uh, the, art, the journals that he did for Lin Yutang. All I can say is uh, I did a search, a Google search for uh, combining the words Shen Song Wan and uh, Xu Xu, and uh, I really went all out. Shen Song Wan ping Xu Xu, Shen Song Wan tan Xu Xu, Shen Song Wan runs into Xu Xu in a coffee shop on Nanjing Road and stuff. It didn't come up, but what came up all the time was the statement that. Uh, the great short story writers were of the era were Lu Xun, Sun Sung Wan, uh, Feng Wen Bing, and uh, and Xu Xu. And uh, this, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, it came from a 1961 uh, Lin Yutang talk at our own Library of Congress. And it was, of course, delivered in English. That was then uh, translated into Chinese. And after a few decades, somebody in China kept Lu Xun, Sun Sun Wan, and Feng Wen Bing, but he uh, erased Xu Xu's name. And that is sometimes taken as why, I don't know, uh, Liu Xiaoming anyway said this is why, uh, you know, our Bible of uh, modern Chinese literature, which coincidentally was also published in 1961, really does not mention Xu Xu. However, probably the, the second best book here, Shanghai Modern um, by uh, Li Ofan, that does mention Xu Xu and particularly his spy novel. So I would say just in uh, conclusion, uh, I'm interested in, uh, you know, the fact that actually author, these non-leftist, non-communist authors from before the revolution, like Shen Sun and Xu Xu, uh, they were not unknown before 1949. They were actually quite famous. Um, 
everybody knew them. They were in all the Chinese biographical dictionaries, uh, but they were forgotten in on the China mainland in the 50s and 60s. And actually, uh, I was thinking that uh, Shang Tsung-wen's solution was to kiss literature goodbye, go into art history. Xu uh, Xu went to Hong Kong at great cost to him. Uh, he must have experienced poverty, uh, breakup of his family, neglect. My impression of uh, Hong Kong literary people right into the you know 70s, 80s, 90s, they weren't much concerned with literature from mainland China. They didn't give a fig about literature from Taiwan. There was the Guomindang trying to win them over for their side. Uh, they weren't much interested in uh, Hong Kong literature either. What was Hong Kong literature? The, the interesting thing is that, and, and I think some of the newspapers that uh, Xu Xu continued to write, in, they were all about martial arts fiction. Uh, wuxia, xiaohua, and all that sort of thing. So my final thought is that uh, Xu Xu's strategy for survival, which really goes before 1949, and one of his special characteristics is he was able to blend themes from highbrow literature with those from popular literature. So uh, ghosts, specters, the strange, zhi guai, the uncanny as the top person in our field, uh, Wang Dewey, David Derwei Wang at Harvard is always talking about uh, spies, romance. Actually, while we're mentioning big people in the field, I see Howard Goldblatt has, who is the premier translator of uh, uh, Chinese modern literature into English. He gives very high ratings. And uh, I should also mention that uh, Xu Xu's works in Chinese, or at least uh, Bird Talk is available in Chinese. And uh, you can get that online just by doing a simple Google search, Niao Yu. And uh, I was reading it uh, just before the talk. Wonderful translation. I really like this. And of course, I love the geography. So I particularly like Xu Xu and Frederick Green's translation before. But if, if we look at uh, Xu Xu after 1949, you know, he blended in to the environment and he continued uh, to, to meld uh, themes from high literature with what was the thing going on in Hong Kong, uh, martial arts fiction, and even got into films. So I think we've got to really uh, congratulate his ingenuity and his creativity, and also that of Frederick Green. So uh, let's take away, let's, let's look at the Q and A. Uh, oh, I saw something from uh, Fionetta Xu herself, but now I don't see it. Um, and it, uh, let, I hope Fionnette will uh, post that yeah, while, 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 you, while you look for them, I, I want to say just a couple of things. Thank you so much for those really thoughtful comments. You've said so many really, really interesting things. Um, the first thing about, you know, Lin Yutang thinking so highly of, you know, among a handful of others of, of Xu Xu, he was really a lifelong promoter and, and um, you know, friend, that was a friendship, but I, genuine appreciation and he particularly liked bird talk he particularly liked bird, bird talk this story and i think for some of the reasons that you said it's it's so chinese it's so chinese in many ways and i'm not saying this in an essentializing way you know in that it draws on so many different traditions but at the same time it is so modern i mean it is fairly ground really you know grounded in, in 20th century modern ideas um, cosmopolitan literary ideas, and I think that's what Lin Yutang really appreciated, and of course, what he always tried to do, right? This bridge between the East and the West of, of in a way, taking the best from both and combining it. Um, and you're absolutely right; it's it's very tragic that he was forgotten, and it it's more political than it is in you know aesthetic, right? That he's really dropped off this radar, and you said he he chose to leave the mainland. Of course, he also chose not to go to Taiwan. You know, had he gone to Taiwan, it probably would have been quite different. But I really do think he he didn't want to make any political compromises either way, and he he did stay in Hong Kong. And um, yeah, I think he suffered quite a lot, especially in the first years, to you know, to make trying to make a, a living as a writer, um, and ultimately becoming an academic. I think that that helped him. Um, but of course, he, he was incredibly prolific in, in Hong Kong. I mean, he wrote so many more works in Hong Kong while he did in, you know, before. 
Um, and, um, you know, it's interesting, he was sort of rediscovered in mainland China in the 1980s, right? All these writers were rediscovered in the 1980s after the Cultural Revolution, during the thaw, people realized, oh my God, we have all this cultural legacy that nobody talked about for, for 20, 30 years. Um, but there was mostly a focus on his pre-war work uh, and his, you know, his Hong Kong work wasn't really read or studied much. Um, and as you also rightly, you know, pointed out, there wasn't so much interest, I think, in, in Hong Kong. Um, you know, his readership was mostly immigrants, right, from mainland China because they shared the sense of nostalgia. But then there was this new generation of Hong Kong writers who were all born in, in Hong Kong and who wrote about Hong Kong. Hong Kong literature was literature that dealt with the city and the urban experience and being proud of, of you know, being from Hong Kong. And, Hong, you know, Xu fiction, of course, so much of it was set in mainland China. And for them, I think that there was a disconnect. Um, but as I sort of mentioned, now people are really embracing him for, for what he was. And um, part of those political statements that he implicitly made by coming to Hong Kong, by not going to Taiwan, by not making any compromises. I think that's something that people in Hong Kong really admire now. Good. Um, uh, we, we've got a question coming oh, in. Oh, sorry. From yeah. uh, Wendy Larson. Yeah. Uh, I, some of the questions I haven't seen uh, haven't appeared on my screen, but suddenly popped up. I'm sorry about the technical difficulty. Also, the chat is... Uh, is visible for me, but it doesn't come out well. So I hope people will post questions on question and answer. Uh, Wendy I, says, I want to say one real quick, one last thing. You know, all his, almost all of his fiction is now actually available on Google Books. You know, um, as eBooks, and it's it's very inexpensive. It's currently being reissued in Taiwan. Um, it's I think it's by now already close to forty volumes. You know, you mentioned the complete works originally in fifteen volumes. There was these really sort of thick ones that would have you know, multiple, um, you know, novels compressed in one. So they're now all coming out as individual books. So if anybody's interested, yeah, just, just go to Google Books, you know, search for Xu Xu, and you can read them in the original in Chinese. Um, and, and they're actually very inexpensive. So sorry, that was the last thing. Okay, so uh, Wendy says, uh, thanks, Frederick. Very interesting talk, which I'm sure we all agree with. I wonder if you could talk a little more about how Xu Xu managed to thread the needle of political commitment Western influence and popular culture and its critique by leftists carving out his own unique stance that later became popular, uh, in, parenthetically, is that the right word? In Hong Kong and even providing an aesthetic stance taken up in film, he seemed to distance himself from everything. <laughs> wow, that's a, that's a, I mean, that's a wonderful question. It's also a huge question. Mm. Uh, you know, so the first part, um, you know, we look at the Republican period now and yeah, we do think of this, you know, these, these literary battles being fought out by the left and, you know, the right and, um, and they, you know, they existed. And I think the criticism that I showed you does show you how heated these debates were. And of course, once we get into, you know, the 1950s, that kind of uh, reputation really would you know, could easily land you in prison or, or, or worse, right? But, you know, I think in the 1930s, people to some degree were <laughs> kind of laughing it off. And I know that Xu Xu, you know, he, he knew Lu Xun very well and had a huge appreciation of him. And it was mutual, you know, Lu Xun actually thought highly of him and, and um, gave him a calligraphy uh, when, when he got married and, you know, Xu Xu wrote a poem. Um, so, you know, I think, um, in the 1930s, at least, yeah, you know, there were differences, but ultimately they were all writers. And um, of course, you know, Xu Xu, because he was so popular, he really was so popular, um, you know, throughout the 30s and 40s that, you know, in a way, the success with his readers just spoke for itself. Um, at the same time, because that kind of criticism that was leveled against him, that's why he decided to leave because he, 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 he saw the writing on the wall. Um, you know, in Hong Kong, he stayed very much engaged with what was going on in, in China. Um, you know, he, he, had, he communicated, at, you know, as long as it was possible, you know, via letters um, with, with friends, um, you know, in China. Actually, uh, you know, Xu Xu's 
daughter, Fiametta, who is, is, is in the audience, I believe you said, um, is now sort of um, going through hundreds and hundreds of letters that she sort of rediscovered, you know, the letters of her father from his Hong Kong period. And it's fascinating, you know, it's fascinating how just how much he stayed, uh, you know, in touch with these people, including people like Joe Zorin, you know, he communicated with him. And, um, you know, he was concerned, obviously, he was very concerned with what's going on in, in, in China, he actually wrote a little bit of fiction uh, about things that were going on in China, um, a little bit like Zhang Ailin, you know, Zhang Ailin wrote them for, right, I mean, she wrote them for the American government. She, she was, you know, while she was in, in, in Hong Kong, she was sort of sponsored to write this, you know, fiction about China. Um, Xu Xu did the same, not because he was sponsored or anything, and, you know, he wasn't working, you know, there's this, this term greenback fiction, he wasn't writing that, he was really just writing things, I think, because he was, he was concerned, he was interested. Um, he wrote this amazing work of fiction. It's a huge, huge uh, novel called Beitsan de Shizhi, uh, A Tragic Era, that he wrote just before the beginning of the Cultural Revolution. But it's basically a work about something very similar to the Cultural Revolution. So I think that's quite, you know, quite, quite amazing that he, he, um, you know, he had this premonition or, you know, he, 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 he saw what was coming. Now, at the same time, he was fiercely critical of Chiang Kai-shek and the you know proto-fascism that he was seeing in Taiwan, and and he wrote about it. You know, he wrote about it. Um, and may, may I ask? Yeah. May I ask what was his relationship to the writers during the war? Uh, during the War of Resistance, the war against yeah. Japan, uh, he lived in Chongqing, uh, in the Chiang Kai-shek controlled territory, but he wrote yeah. his spy novel there. You know, the, so the spy novel Feng Xiaoxiao, that is, 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 you know, it's pretty apolitical. I mean, it really is a spy fiction. Um, and if anything, you know, it's, um, you know, it portrays the war against Japan as, you know, as a just war, you know, something, you know, the Japanese need to be defeated. At the same time, it's not this kind of black and white anti-Japanese fiction that we all see. It's actually quite complex. And, you know, there are Japanese characters and, you know, he wrote some plays during the war that are amazing, where there are, you know, these brothers, one of them is actually half Japanese and he's fighting with the Japanese and he meets his brother whom he had been estranged with, who was fighting in the resistance. So these very existentialist conflicts. So that's something really interesting, I think about Xu Xu, that no, he, you know, he, he, he was never black and white, you know, he, he didn't want to sort of fall into that clear dichotomy between evil and, and good and um but um so you know Chongqing yeah he left you know he was in Shanghai he left obviously you know when everybody left after the fall of the foreign concession in 1941 he went to Chongqing um and you know he tried <laughs> he tried to get by and he wrote so he wrote this this work um Feng Xiao Xiao the rustling wind it was serialized in a wartime newspaper the you know the Chongqing wartime newspaper Sao Dang Bao. And it, I mean, it just became this in, incredible bestseller. And then towards the end of the war, you know, the Sao Dang Bao, this newspaper sent him actually to America as a war correspondent. And I sometimes wondered whether they did that sort of, you know, as a, as a to show their, <laughs> to, the, to show their gratitude that he had written this, this work that helped them sell a lot of newspapers. I don't know. And he, you know, he was actually in New York, uh, in, in America for a couple of years. Um, and very much immersed himself in literature and he translated, I think he, uh, he started to write a book about, um, you know, American fiction. Um, and then, you know, then he returned to China, um, and he started to re, uh, edit a lot of the works, his pre-war works and wartime works. Um, and he was actually, you know, quite well off, you know, because these works sold so well, he was so well known. I mean, he, Hands down, he was one of probably the most well, you know, widely read and most recognized writers of the period. And he was going to settle down. He had bought a house in Ningbo. He had gotten married um, again, um, and he was just, you know, going to settle down and write. And then, you know, and then history happened, and he realized that he needed to leave for, for a period of time, uh, which then became. This lifelong exile. So um, um, I think I, I only answered part of the question. 
I noticed an interest in Henri Bergson in, in his past. Did you see any influence on his writing? Yeah, you know, um, I, I kind of kept it out of the talk because it, uh, it, it would have, you know, I think it would have, yeah, just um, complicated matters. But uh, it's, I'm glad that you mentioned that, you know, Henri Bergson is this French philosopher who is not much read anymore, <laughs> but who in the 1920s was an absolute worldwide bestseller. He had gotten the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1927 or 28, even though he was a philosopher. And he sort of was a anti-Darwinian writer and philosopher who really sort of was, you know, especially in his writing about art, understood art as this thing that would allow us to connect with truths that cannot be explained by science, you know, the sublime. Um, and that was something that really appealed to Xu Xu. He, you know, he, he read him as a student, you know, at, at Beida, Beijing University. And then, you know, when he went to France in the 30s, I think it was in part because of that, that interest in, you know, French literature, French philosophy, Bergson probably. Um, and, you know, I do see that. I do see, and Xu Xu himself, he spoke of that influence you know, several times in, in his own critical writings and his, his own literary, uh, you know, essays. Um, and I do see that. I do see that. that well, well, and Frederick, I, uh, yeah. is, is there interest in Shushu in China today? Obviously, the literary forum is not very liberal today. It's not as yeah. good as it was a yeah. few, but has there been renewed interest in Shushu? Very much, uh, very much. So, you know, in the 1980s, um, as I mentioned before, uh, he was rediscovered, and a lot of his works were reissued, especially of the, you know, those exotic works, the pre-war fiction. Of course, also Linear Tongue was being rediscovered at the time, and it kind of went hand in hand. Um, you know, Linear Tongue, more recently, again, has sort of disappeared, and I think Linear Tongue is somebody who is rather suspect to the, you know, his regime because he was this cosmopolitan who really said, you know, we have to we have to bridge east and west take the best of east and west and and you know build bridges and i well i i don't want to make it too political but um you know shushu because it's fiction and it's um it's accessible and it's fun um i you know people keep reading him people have him lash on it you know his complete actually i have a couple of slides let me go back to share mode his complete um, works were reissued in China um, in 2008. That was his the 100th anniversary of his of his birth. Um, and you know, some of his works were actually picked up uh, by to, and adapted to the stage. So Guilin, Ghost Love, <laughs> um, was put on stage in uh, first in Shanghai. And then in Hong Kong, actually, there was a, a, an opera, you know, somebody um, made a chamber opera out of it. But what is probably even more interesting is that Wang Anyi, right, the famous Shanghai female writer, contemporary writer, she actually adapted The Rustling Wind, this wartime spy novel, Feng Xiao Xiao, uh, to the stage. Oops, there's a typo here, Shanghai, I just noticed that. Um, and, you know, oh, sorry, there's another, <laughs> another image um i haven't unfortunately seen that and you know a lot of his actually a lot of his poetry he also wrote so much poetry a lot of his poetry was actually set to music even you know during his lifetime Shushi was very interested in classical music in western classical music and that's something else that's really interesting in a lot of his fiction um, you know, music plays a really important role. Some of the characters are musicians or composers, or they will just listen to mostly romantic music. Um, you know, you, so you mentioned Bergson, you know, Bergson is very much an heir to rom romanticism, you know, a 20th century romantic. And this is sort of my take on Xu Xu. I, I really understand him as a romantic writer, really in the philosophical European sense of romanticism. Um, I've, so I've got one more question for you. Uh... Frederick, if you don't mind. No, uh, please. If people are looking at the chat, I don't know if you can see that uh, Fiametta Xu uh, says that in a 1980 conference in Paris, Xu Xu reconnected with a number of his old writer friends from China and in Hong Kong. He maintained close friendship with some 
leftist writers like Tao Juran. I wonder if he ever connected with uh, or, or had uh, literary intercourse with uh, Li Huiyin and uh, some of those other people in Hong Kong. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, Tao Juran is a really good example. I'm glad Fia brought that up. You know, obviously a, a leftist writer, but they were very, very close friends. You know, they I think they even had a, a publishing venture for, uh, you know, for, for, for a time. You know, I think in Hong Kong, and you know, I, I think these writers, they, you know, their political allegiances didn't really matter that much. I think it was that, you know, they were being, they were writers. Maybe they had that shared legacy from, you know, the re Republican period. That's what made them bond, if anything else. Um, and, you know, um, mm, yeah, I think, you know, I think they were all nostalgic, right? They were all, they, they were all nostalgic. You know, Xu Xu, um, you know, obviously he, he did make Hong Kong his home. And um, even though, you know, he felt nostalgic for the mainland, I think he, he was also, you know, grateful for the opportunities he had there and, you know, just um, having an audience. And, um, you know, he, he had, he was very interested in cinema. You know, he, he liked cinema. I, um, Fia, you know, Fia Meta shared this recording once with, with, with me. Um, it's amazing. He had a, like a, this long conversation with a film critic and they're just discussing film, you know, European cinema and, um, and you know, how much it, or whether it impacted his writing. Um, and he was, you know, very much involved in the, the adaptation of his work to the screen. So he wrote some of the screenplays himself. Um, and I think, you know, when I said earlier that at some point his fiction didn't appeal to a younger generation of Hong Kong readers anymore, just because it was so steeped in the mainland in this bygone era, the films managed to bridge that in that a lot of the films, even though the novel might be set in mainland China, the films are set in Hong Kong and the films, you know, the films are kind of Hong Kong movies. And a lot of the themes, of course, are somewhat universal. You know, love. A lot of his work is about love. Um, so I think the movies sort of, for a while, um, you know, made him more relevant. Of course, movies, in a way, have an even shorter shelf life than literature, right? <laughs> New movie comes out every year, every year. So uh, uh, Shushu died in eight, 1980. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So he did not get to see the real opening up of mainland China. No. And in a way, he didn't get to see the real development of Hong Kong literature as we know it today. No. Um, you know, he did play a really big role. And this is something interesting. You know, Liang Binjun, who is this very, very important critic and writer, Hong Kong, you know, writer and critic. And pr he was a professor at Lingnan University. I studied under him, you know, a few years when I was doing my my you know, dissertation research on Xu Xu, and he actually said this to me. He said, you know, we didn't like reading him because for us he was a mainland writer, and we wanted we wanted people to to write about Hong Kong and be proud of Hong Kong. But, and he said this several times, you know, they they did or, or they felt a sense of gratitude towards Xu Xu because Xu Xu, you know, he edited several journals. He promoted this new generation of writers and he was a professor at university and he taught a lot of them. You know, there are several, actually I met with a couple of them in Hong Kong who had been his students and they became writers themselves. So he certainly, you know, he really left, um, he, um, you know, he, he left an imprint on Hong Kong, Hong Kong literature. Um, and again, I think this is something that people, you know, that people recognize now um, more and more. What do you think, Jim? Shall we wrap it up now? Uh, we are past time. Well, we're past time, but I want to say a couple of things. First of all, Frederick, thank you so much for a fabulous talk. It was really wonderful. And thank you, Jeff, for your great question moderating, moderating the uh, talk afterwards. And I want to thank everyone in attendance and remind you that this talk will be posted on our Northwest China Council YouTube site uh, at some point before too long. So if you are in the audience and you know someone that would like to see it, please uh, send the future link to hearing this via YouTube. And I also want to say that I don't think we're quite done with Shushu just yet because the film stories, which we'd love to do a film, uh, something about film sometime, 
We do have a movie group that meets regularly. So uh, we want to come back and think about one of the films and also the stories that you mentioned relating to plays. Uh, and and uh, uh, I think there's somebody here in the audience, uh, Thea, who I might be in touch with fairly soon about what might be a, another thing to do down the road, because I think there's much more we can do uh, talking about this writer and all of the impacts that he had uh, in so many ways. So, so uh, thank you again for, for making it possible for us to start the talk about Shu Shu and also to make the book that you just translated available in a bigger way. You know, and it hadn't been for COVID, we could have had a book signing or something here in Portland, you know, but it's so nice to have you by Zoom. And, uh, you know, I'll be uh, mentioning the link, which I put in the chat line and in our next newsletter so that people can find Stonebridge Press and your book uh, and, and get a chance to get a copy. Um, John, thank you, thank uh, you, Jim. I just oh, want to, you, you mentioned Stonebridge Press. Oh, I yeah. actually quickly just want to do a shout out to Stonebridge Press and, and Peter Goodman, the editor. You know, it's a, it's a small press that specializes in, in East Asian stuff. They've done a lot on J Japanese and they also now do a little bit on Chinese and they're an independent press. And, you know, they took this on, you know, and it's always a risk for them. And they did such a wonderful job with the book, um, I, I think, you know, the, the cover and the editing. So thank you. The map. Don't forget the map. The map. The map. <laughs> Peter Goodman, <laughs> such a wonderful editor. Who know something about the streets of Shanghai. It's just really wonderful to get the map out and go, wow, I've been here. And oh, if I'd only had this book when I was last in Shanghai, you know, I would have looked up a few more places. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a really great book in so many ways. And, and so thank you for your work and for joining Northwest China Council tonight. Join us again. And Frederick, I can't wait to talk to you again uh, by Zoom and eventually, hopefully in person. So thank you very much. And Jeff, John, thank you all. And we'll see you again. Bye-bye. Thank you again.